Talk to me about the Hadrian Collider, because I think that's something that everyone watches, they see, and I think most people would say, you, you know, they're obviously looking into some quantum aspects and some atomic level stuff. What, what have we learned from the Collider and what have we not learned? Well, I think this is a great thing to talk about because it shows the difference between what particle physics has become really, really good at and what it's choosing to ignore. So things like what the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva does, this is a giant, you know, 25 mile around uh, ring under the ground where there's these tubes that are emptied out and you shoot protons around them very, very close to the speed of light, 99.999999% speed of light, and they smash into each other. And you ask what comes out, okay? And one of the things that came out was the Higgs boson discovered in 2012. And both doing those experiments and making the predictions, theoretically, for what's going to be seen by those experiments, that's where physicists are really, really good. I mean, the Large Hadron Collider was literally the most complicated machine ever built by human beings. And the predictions of these particles were made in the 1960s, and then it was seen in 2012. So the predictions are just made by theoretical physicists like Peter Higgs, Francois Anglaire, Robert Brout, and based on trying to come up with a theory that made sense. You know, you knew some basic features of the world and you knew the math. And just on the basis of that, they were able to see decades into the future and say, if you do the right thing, you'll see a little particle being created. Mm. That's just exquisite and beautiful and a real triumph of both human beings trying to understand the world and of the power of physics to get the world right. Just like Einstein in 1915 coming up with general relativity and then we discover gravitational waves from black holes in you know, 2016. Yeah. Um, on the other hand, you don't need to understand much about the foundations of quantum mechanics to do the Large Hadron Collider. All you need to know is you smash particles together, there's a certain probability that when you observe what comes out in your detector, you're gonna see this particle or that particle or some other particle. If you say, yes, but what do you mean observe and measure and all those sort of philosophical sounding questions? Nobody knows or cares who works at the Large Hadron Collider. That is not their deal. They wanna predict what you will see. They do not want to ask what's really going on at that moment when the measurement is being made. Hmm. In a, so in a weird way, it's it's not that advanced or not. Well, it's advanced in one direction, right. but not the other, okay. right? And so yeah. we're choosing to be really, really good at one kind of thing, which is very practical. Like one of the reasons, there's many reasons, but one of the reasons why the focus of physics shifted in this way was the center of physics moved from Europe to the United States, right? Like all of the great founders of quantum mechanics were European one way or the other. But then the next generation of real geniuses like Feynman, like Gelman and others were mostly American. And the Americans, you know, bless their hearts, but they have a much more practical attitude. They're like, what can I do with this? What can I build with it? What can I make with it? Right. Or at least even if you're a physicist, what can I observe? What can I see, right? What experiment can I do? People like Einstein and Bohr were deeply immersed in traditions of philosophy and humanistic inquiry. And people like Richard Feynman were not. They didn't want to hear about that stuff. And so, you know, it, there's, the, there's this joke that the motto became shut up and calculate. And that's not really the motto, but it's a pretty good you know, summary of what the attitude became.